Good morning. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. Thank you this morning for allowing us to gather here in your presence, Lord, for calling us into your light, for rescuing us from the death and darkness that we were in apart from you, Lord, for giving us life, for making us your children. God, we pray that as we sing these songs, they would be an expression of gratitude for all that you've done for us and an acknowledgement of just how great you are, Lord, that just by virtue of who you are, you are worthy of all of our praise. We thank you, Lord, and give you the rest of this service. Ask you to have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Grand earth has quaked before Moved by the sound Seas let all shaking and stern can be calm and broken from my regard. And through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, through it all, it is well. Well, we 
with me. Beyond measure, my day. 
forever my life will follow you I will walk in all your ways Forever I'll follow you You give a love that none can measure You bring your joy to my thirsty soul You offer a life that lasts forever You give a grace like none I know And I am in love with you I am in love with you I am in love with you I am in love with you, with you. Jesus Forever my soul will rest in you In the safety of your arms Forever I'll rest in you Forever I'll stand amazed with you At the wonder of your love Forever I'll stand amazed you give a love that none can measure You bring your joy to my thirsty soul You offer a life that lasts forever You give a grace like none I've known And I am in love with you 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 you give a love that none can measure You bring your joy to my thirsty soul You offer a life that lasts forever you give a grace like none I've known And I am in love with you 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 with you Jesus I am in love with you forever my heart will sing of you I will praise you all my days forever I'll sing of you
is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life I freely give because of your hearts and our minds. Remove anything that might distract us. Help us to give you our full attention. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment to say hello to one another. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you're here. We got a couple of announcements. Uh, we've got Bless Fest this Wednesday night, and it's going to be an opportunity of time and testimony and just worship and, and just thanksgiving and what the Lord's done in our life. And we're going to hear some really cool stories about just people worshiping through different storms of life. And so, we, if you know of anyone, that's going through something or that they don't have plans for Thanksgiving, please bring them. We want, we want to make this just, you know, the Lord is so faithful to all of us. And so we want to just take this time just to, just to set aside and, and just honor him with, with just in, and celebrate what he's doing in all of our lives. So once again, it's Wednesday night at 5.30 is whenever food's going to start being served and we'll have some time and testimony and just some time of worship. We've also got Christmas caroling coming up Saturday, December 8th at 6 p.m., We'll be organizing the carols, and uh, you know we're always looking for volunteers to, who want to go out and just sing songs and, and outreach in the community. So if you all want to participate in that or any other questions that you have, always please come to the Connection Center in the back, and, and let's, just, uh, let's just serve the Lord together. And so let's pray. 
Father God, Lord, we just come before you, and I just thank you just for being able to come to your house today, Lord. I just pray that every aspect of this service would just bring glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, good morning. Welcome this morning. Hey, if you need a Bible this morning, raise your hand real high. We'll get a Bible into your hand so you can follow along with us. Don't want to miss out this morning. You can see we're not making this stuff up as we go through. There's, there's some really good news this morning as we get into Romans chapter 4. Um, also, one quick announcement. Uh, we have a uh, special couple with us. Um, they are our missionaries from Peru. And uh, they were not here first service, but I think they are here second service. Uh, Kenneth and Letty Dujay, are you here? Raise your hands, the Dujay family. You can all raise your hands. Yes, good. They're right in the back here, two rows from the, I think, I can't see that far. Um, they, listen, they're going to be here this afternoon at 5 o'clock. If you're not doing anything, um, I would encourage you, please come back. Um, they're going to be, sh- have a, we're going to have a time of sharing. They're going to share with us and maybe do a little uh, Q&A with them also, have a chance to pray with them and encourage them. And so they're with us for uh, a short period of time, and we just want to really make them feel at home and, and blessed here. And so if you can come back, 5 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary, Romans chapter 4. If you haven't turned there yet, I've got to get there myself. Romans 4, good time to turn there, be there. Romans 4. After first service, um, two people came up to me and asked if they could be baptized, which was really cool. Like, yeah, praise the Lord. It's like, and um, that like wasn't even like the thrust of the message or anything, but it was really cool to hear that. So listen, if God is stirring your heart, you want to get dunked, um, Come see me after service. It looks like we're going to do one, and it won't be cold out. We have the, the heated uh, tub uh, in the warehouse, so it would be nice and toasty for you if we do it in a couple of weeks. So let's pray and ask the Lord to, um, to bless our time this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for your great love for us as we are going to learn, Lord, as we study the book of Romans, that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. Thank you that as your children, our lives are in your hands. For how you cherish us. And for how you nourish us. We are in need of you teaching us and nourishing us this morning with your word. And and by the power of your spirit, ministering to our hearts and changing us transforming our lives as only you can. And so we open up our hearts to you this morning, and we're so thankful for what you're going to do. We don't want to leave the same people we came in, but have a a deep, wonderful work of your Spirit within us, amongst us. And so we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and it's in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus, that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, so just by way of reminder as we're working our way through uh, the book of Romans, this is a letter. You remember when it was first written, Paul was writing to the churches that were in Rome, and there were no chapter breaks, no verse breaks, just one flowing letter. But we have found ourselves in chapter 4, and the first three chapters, we learned some amazing things, didn't we? We learned about being justified by faith, and we're going to talk about that this morning, um, what that means, what that entails. But remember, Paul had painted this black kind of backdrop about of all humanity. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and he, and he, and he really highlighted those things, and no one escapes uh, escapes the judgment of God. We are all uh, in need of forgiveness. We are all in need of a Savior. It was like the Apostle Paul in the first few chapters was stripping us, stripping us of self-righteousness, of our own performance, our own achievements, our own works, our own attempts of trying to become right before God or earn our way 
into heaven. And what's so beautiful is when you recognize that, man, I am stripped, I got nothing before God, what does he do when we place our trust in his son, Jesus Christ? He clothes us with the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls it a robe of righteousness. That's so beautiful. Remember, in fact, remember when Jesus was at, uh, I think it was at a Pharisee's house, and he was teaching, and he was talking about this wedding where the guy invites all the people, and people are coming in, and each person gets a special robe, right, to put on, the special outfit to wear in that feast, and then one dude comes cruising in in his own robe. And what happened to him? Dude, you're out of here, right? You don't get in with your own robe. You don't get in with your own efforts. That's a picture of that. Listen, you will not stand before God and be accepted into heaven on your own righteousness, your own works, your own efforts. And I'm bringing that up because the Jews, um, especially during Paul's day, they were trusting in, number one, they were trusting in, uh, in Father Abraham, in their, in their background, their bloodline. They, were, they said, hey, since we are descendants of Abraham, we're getting into the kingdom. You Gentiles or non-Jews, the only reason you're created is to fuel the fires of hell, man. That's a pretty bad attitude to have, isn't it? So not in touch with the heart of God who loves the world, wants to rescue the world. And so they were trusting in their bloodline. They were trusting in being related to Abraham. And not only that, they were trusting in circumcision, this physical right, this physical uh, thing that they did, they believed that that right made them righteous before God, and not just that, they were trusting in themselves of keeping the law. Hey, we've kept the law, we've kept the rules, and we've learned in, in these first few chapters, none of us can keep the rules, none of us can keep the law. There is no ritual that will make us right before God, because some people trust in baptism, you guys. Oh, I was baptized as a baby, I'm going in. I'm going to heaven. Oh, I was baptized. You know, I came forward, gave my life to Jesus, got baptized, but I'm still living in sin, fornicating, doing drugs, partying. Listen, if there hasn't been a change in your life, then there hasn't been a change. If you're not born again of God's Spirit and you got dunked, all you are is wet. I'm sorry. I love you. But there needs to be some reality in walking with Jesus, a relationship with Him. It's not a ritual that makes us right before God. I played baseball with a guy from Puerto Rico, love him dearly, shared with him a lot, and he had this big, giant, like, cross necklace. I mean, it was, this thing was hunk and huge, like, and he'd open his shirt, you know, his jersey, and that thing would be hanging out, and I asked him, dude, what is that, you know, you don't follow Jesus, but, so what's the deal? Is that a T? Is that, you know, what, why are you wearing that thing? And he says, when I die, I got this on, I'm going straight to heaven. I'm like, dude, no, you're not. (laughs) That's not going to get you into heaven. There's only one way. It's trusting in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you in his work. And so some people think, I was raised in the church. I'm, getting, I'm going into heaven. No, I'm sorry. No. You know, we look at the Jews and they were trusting in Abraham. Some people trust in, because their family is Christian, that they're automatically getting into heaven. No, each one of us is individually responsible before God. We're, again, we're all guilty. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet God has provided. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believes in him shall never perish, but have everlasting life. And we know we can't keep the law. We can't keep the rules. We've broken the rules. And we've talked about that. And so last chapter, you may remember, we learned this word justified. When you place your trust in Jesus Christ, when you are believing in him, trusting in him, the Bible says you are justified. And one simple way to remember it is it's just as if I'd never sinned at all. Your sins are forgiven, forgotten, gone forever. Is that not good news? All your sins and lawless deeds are forgiven, and God says, I will remember them no more. That's awesome. But justification, there's more to that. It's not just being declared not guilty. It's not just all your sins being forgiven. But there's this beautiful thing that happens. In place of our sin comes the very righteousness of God, you guys, given to our account. We're going to see this term used 11 times. How many times in this chapter? 11 times, depending upon your translation. 11 times we're going to see this word or words used over and over. Impute imputed, reckoned, reckoned, accounted, accounted. We're going to see that over and over and over. And what it means, it's a business term or, or, a, uh, or, a, or a commerce or a finance term in which something is placed in your account. 
And so what happens is, when we place our trust in Jesus Christ, sins forgiven, forgotten, gone forever, and God places his righteousness into your account. Isn't that beautiful? My daughter Sloan, you guys know Sloan, she's at college right now. She's been running out of funds in her account. And so we've been floating funds into her account. She didn't earn it, she didn't deserve it, she didn't work for it. But by the grace of mom and dad, <laughs> we have imputed it, we have reckoned it, we have accredited it into her account. That's the idea, is it's put on our account. And so, so glorious. And we learned last week that justification by faith is not some new thing. It's been witnessed, we learned last week, it's been witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, this is not some new thing that God came up with. We can learn about righteousness by faith all the way back into the Old Testament. And what's going to happen here in chapter 4 is Paul is going to call two witnesses to the stand to testify of justification by faith, that we are declared righteous by, by grace through faith from the Old Testament. And so the first witness he will call is Father Abraham. You guys remember Father, Father Abraham? Father Abraham and many sons, right? And many sons had Father Abraham, and I'm one of them. So are you. So let's all, what, sin, praise the Lord, right foot, left, hand, something like that, right? Praise the Lord. I can't remember all the, it's been a while. And so, so great. So let's check this out. Let's see what God's Word says. Chapter 4, verse 1, after the longest intro ever. <laughs> what then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so remember, for the Jew, their, their hero, the one they looked to, was Father Abraham. And the point that Paul is going to make as we work our way through this chapter, Galatians chapter 3 also, is that you become a, a, uh, 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 one of Abraham's sons by faith in Jesus Christ. It's so important to take note of that. We become uh, a, a, a son of his, an offspring of his, by simple faith in Jesus Christ. And you guys remember Abraham. Paul is writing to a group of people that were familiar with their Bibles. He didn't have to go back and say, here's the context, here's what's going on, here's what it says. These were people that were familiar with the Scriptures, and so we need to know the Scriptures, you guys. It tells us all the way back in Genesis chapter, who remembers, Genesis chapter 12, thank you. Genesis chapter 12, God appeared to Abram. His, his name wasn't changed yet. It was Abram. You guys remember? He was in Ur of the Chaldees, right? Joshua 24 tells us he was an idolater. He was a heathen, pagan idolater there in modern-day Iraq. And all of a sudden, God shows up, appears to him. We're told in Acts 7, Stephen tells us that. God appeared to Abraham and said what? Get up. Leave your country, leave your family, go to the place that I will show you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm going to bless those that bless you, curse those that curse you. I'm going to bring you into the land. I'm going to give you descendants as, as numerous as the stars in the sky. And what did Abraham do? He got, got up with Sarah, grabbed nephew Lot, and boom, little pit stop in Haran, finally came up and around the, uh, the, 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 the Mesopotamia River Valley all the way into Israel and parked it there. You guys remember, he parked it in the promised land, and over and over and over again, he had these amazing encounters with God, God taking him deeper and deeper into his relationship with him. And doesn't the Lord do that in our lives, you guys? Ho hopefully he is. <laughs> As we're looking to Him and walking with Him, our relationship is getting deeper and deeper with Him. As we walk by faith and not by sight, as we're trusting His Word, we're going to learn about that in just a minute, about trusting, trusting God's promises. And so Abraham received this promise from God, Genesis 15, I think it's like verse 6, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abraham what? Abraham believed God. 
He believed God, you guys. And it was accredited to him, put into his account for what? What does it say? For righteousness. It doesn't say his works made him righteous. It doesn't say he achieved righteousness. It doesn't say his circumcision made him righteous. It was simply believing God. Isn't that beautiful? It's that simple. And we're going we're gonna to be like, reiterate, you're going to be like, like, okay, enough, pastor. I've heard this enough. You're going to hear it so many times this morning, but we can't hear it enough. Because it's all about what God has done for us, you guys. It's not what I've done for God. It's all about what he's done for us and for me and for you. We love him because, why? Because he first loved us. He's always the initiator, and we are the responders to him, to his grace and to his goodness, to his love. And so notice verse 4. It says, now to him who works, the wages or the pay are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So Paul uses what? Kind of like an earthly illustration, doesn't he? You work for someone, you've agreed on a certain wages or a salary, that person is indebted to you, that person is required to pay you. That's not grace. It's not, it's not unearned, undeserved. I worked for that money, correct? You owe it to me, man. That's not grace. That's not a gift. It's just I'm getting what I deserve for the time I put in, the hours I put in, the work I put in. But here's the deal. Paul's making a point. God is a debtor to no man. You cannot work enough to make him in debt to you. God owes us nothing. We owe him everything, you guys. He's he's chosen again to forgive us and, and remember our sins no more when we placed our trust in Jesus Christ. It's glorious. Being declared righteous has nothing to do with our works or our efforts. It's by grace through faith. And then look at verse 5. The person who doesn't try to work for righteousness but trusts God simply, what? His faith is accounted for righteousness. This is so beautiful. That's a miracle, you guys. That's a miracle what happens. This transaction, God giving you and me his righteousness. Again, the focus is on what he has done. He justifies, what does it say? The really good people? What is your Bible? The ungodly, right? That's us. That's every one of us. If you're saying, no, not me, go back and read the first three chapters. He justifies the ungodly. He legally declares you and I righteous because of our trust in Jesus Christ. When God looks at you and me in Christ, he sees through, I I would say, blood-covered lenses. (laughs) He sees you and me in Jesus Christ. He sees his son. The righteousness of his son, the son that he allowed to be brutalized. I mean, can you, I can't imagine watching my son get brutalized or my child being brutalized and allowing that to happen, yet he allowed it to happen. Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him, the joy of presenting you and me faultless, the Bible says, before the Father with exceeding joy. It's going to make him happy to present you and me before him. So glorious. And when we get it, what's the response when you get it? When you finally understand this, when it clicks, it's like, oh man, I can't earn my way to heaven. I can't work my way to heaven. It's all because of what you've done. Wow, that's awesome. Look at at the next verse, next three verses. It says in verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Isn't that awesome? So David here describes what? How blessed is the man to whom God imputes righteousness to their account by faith, not by works. And think about David, by the way. You guys remember David? David was a man after God's own heart, right? 
Guys, he's a man who loved God and blew it. Didn't he blow it? You guys remember Bathsheba? Uriah the Hittite? He blew it big time, didn't he? Adultery, murder, lying, covering it up. And then what happened? Nathan the, pop, Nathan the prophet popped him, busted him, right? Remember David's response? He was broken. I have sinned against God. Remember, under the Old Testament economy, adultery or murder, that's capital punishment. You have no chance. And yet God forgave him. Oh, there were consequences. We know, we read about it. But God said, you are forgiven. And that psalm that he just quotes here, Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, he just quotes from that. That came after after, after that happened with Bathsheba, and what's he saying? He said, Lord, <laughs> blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. I can't believe it. I cannot believe I'm forgiven. That you're not going to impute sin to my account. You're going to impute righteousness to my account. I deserve to be dead. I deserve to be killed. And remember in that, I think it's in that psalm where he talks about, he talks about, listen, the sacrifices that, that God you're looking for are not animal sacrifices. I'd, I'd have brought them. The sacrifices that you're looking for are a broken heart, a contrite spirit and a broken heart. I throw myself at the mercy of God. That's how we come into the kingdom. That's how we continue in the kingdom, you guys, is throwing myself at the mercy of God. God, I need you. I need your grace. I need your grace and mercy every day. I need a work of your spirit every day in my life. And that's what David was saying. David got it. God imputes righteousness as a gift. David certainly didn't earn it or deserve it. He broke the law. He was a lawbreaker, and yet he trusted in God. So beautiful. He trusted in God's provision for him. Well, the question then comes up, is this blessedness only for the Jews? Is this only a Jewish thing? Or can non-Jews, Gentiles, also be included in this program of righteousness by faith? Look at the next verse, verse 9. I'm going to read 9 through 12 because it's one thought that Paul is, uh, is nailing here. He, he asks a question. Look at verse 9 with me, gang. Does this blessedness... And by the way, aren't we blessed? <laughs> do, you, do you guys still rejoice in this? Like, wow. I, I'm like blown away reading this again and studying this. Am I living in this joy? Oh, Lord, thank you. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Or just the, is this just, just for the Jews or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Bear with, bear with me here, keep reading. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. Why? That he might be the father of who? Of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. And so the question, is this just a Jewish program? And the answer is no. And he's going to say why. And the point he's making here is that Abraham was counted righteous. Righteousness was given to his account, accredited to his account, before circumcision was even given. It was before he was even circumcised. It wasn't because he was circumcised that he was declared righteous or, or righteousness was given to his account. It was in chapter 15, this is so important, you guys. It was in chapter 15, God imputed righteousness to his account. In chapter 17, about 14 years later, you guys, 14 years later is when God gave him the sign or the seal of the circumcision. And again, by and large, the Jews had a tremendous confidence in Father Abraham, circumcision, and the point being made, Abraham was declared righteous before circumcision. Listen, justification, 
um, is apart from from any any or any other ritual. It's apart from any any ritual or rite. Justification is apart from anything you can do, any of your achievements, any of your efforts. There's nothing we can do except simply trust in Jesus Christ in order to be justified. Such an important thing. Look at verse 11 and 12. Abraham received the sign of circumcision before being circumcised. And notice what it says there. It says circumcision is what? It's a seal of the righteousness of the faith. In other words, it's an outward sign, guys, of an inward reality. It's an, it's an outward sign of an inward reality. Again, I bring it back to baptism. When we get baptized, it is an outward sign of what's transpired in my heart and in my life. When you get dunked in the water, again, some of you longer than others, just held down a little longer. No, just kidding. Don't, don't let that frighten you. Everybody goes down the same amount of time, usually. And then you, and then you get brought back up. You're saying, I am reckoning my old man dead, my old life. Dead in the baptismal waters. And I am rising up in the newness of life. I'm going to live after the Spirit. I want everyone here to know that I follow Jesus. That if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I'm going to walk in that now. Again, if that's not a reality in your life then again, all you are, I, I, I say that, all you are is wet. There needs to be a change in your life, a change in your heart that God produces. But the deal is God is equal opportunity here, you guys. Look what it says. God is equal opportunity. This whole scene went down so Abraham would become the father of faith to all, to all who believe. Jews, non-Jews, God desires to impute righteousness, to accredit righteousness, to everyone that will trust in his son, you guys. That's the point he's making. Righteousness is available to all. <laughs> love it. Well, verse 13. For the promise, I love this, for the promise that he, that Abraham would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Why? Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. And if you go back and study Abraham's life, God made some amazing promises to Abraham. One of those pro promises is that he and his seed, his offspring, would be heir of what? Heir of the world. What does that mean if you're an heir? You inherit something, correct? You guys with me? You know what I'm talking about? Being an heir? Like maybe your grandma left you in her will beautiful quilt. It smells like mothballs. But she, she goes home to be with the Lord, and guess what? Guess what you get? You are the heir to that amazing quilt, the mothball smelling quilt. You guys know what I'm talking about? You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You're simply the recipient of that thing <laughs> that'll wake you up. You smell that? Oh, man. <laughs> it's free. You inherit it. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. It was simply given to you. That's the idea here. Again, the point that, that Paul is making is that Abraham is inheriting these promises, inheriting the world, inheriting all of this simply because of his trust in the Lord, not because he kept the law. The law, listen, check this out. The law wouldn't come until 430 years later. The law wasn't even given yet. He wasn't keeping the law. And so 430 years later, the law would be given. And so it says who Abraham's seed are too. I love that. Who is Abraham's seed? Does it say those who what? Those who simply of like faith. Verse 13. To his seed, through the law, uh, through the righteousness of faith. Not to Abraham, through to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law, verse 14, are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If the heirs of the world 
If the recipients of these promises were those who keep the law, then faith is obsolete. It's, it's valueless. And God's promises are null and void of no use. If following rules makes you righteous, then there's no need for faith. There's no need for trust in God. Why? Verse 15 tells us, the law does what? The law or the rules bring about wrath. If you live by the law, you're sunk. The misunderstanding of the Jews and prideful man is that I can keep the law. I can keep the rules. I can keep the commandments. I can get to heaven on my own efforts. And the problem is we break the law on a pretty consistent basis, don't we, gang? And Abraham didn't keep the law or the rules, did he? Did Abraham live a perfect life, you guys? Did Abraham ever blow it? You guys remember when? You guys remember when Abraham blew it? Chilling out in the promised land, a little famine hits. Travel southbound where? To Egypt. Remember what he says to his honey? Hey, Sarah, when we get into Egypt, would you tell him you're my sister? Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> because what will happen is when they see how beautiful you are, they're going to kill me. So here's what we'll do. You say, you're my sister, I'll live, and they'll take you into the harem. Sound good? Yeah, okay. Real, Abe, really? <laughs> Come on, dude. I'm supposed to be your wife's protector, recovering, not throwing her to the bus. Maybe that's resonating with some of us dudes here this morning. Remember what he did again? Remember, he also made another mistake, didn't he? You guys remember? He did, I think he did that on a couple occasions, by the way, too. One more. He wasn't perfect, right? It wasn't his perfect walk with God that made him righteous. That's the point. You guys remember he did something else, didn't he? Got in the promised land for a little bit. It was 75 years. He was 70, listen, he was 75 years old when he got called out of Ur the Chaldees, and it wasn't until he was 100 when he had Isaac, the promised son. During that time, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting, time's passing. You know what? We're, we're not getting any younger, honey. Sarah comes to Abraham, and what does she say? Hey, uh, maybe we should help God out, loose paraphrase. Why don't you take my handmaid, Hagar, and you guys will have the, the, the promised child, and then we'll take the promised child and everything will be all good. And what does Abraham say? Duh, okay. <laughs> I'll go sleep with your handmaid. But none of, you know what's interesting? None of that's mentioned here. My performance doesn't make me right before God. It makes me unacceptable. Again, it, it, we should see our need how much we need the Lord. So verse 16, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to what? To grace. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, God said, I have made you a father of many nations. This is so beautiful. So the promise is of faith according to what? The grace of God. The, the promise is not based upon performance, achievement, but simple trust. This ensures something, you guys. This ensures that the promise is available or the promises are available to anyone, to anybody, you guys, that's trusting in the Lord. And His promise is available to all, but receiving God's promises comes by only one way, by grace, through faith. Please notice one word in verse 16. I have it circled in my Bible. If it's not circled or highlighted, it should be at least in your heart. That word, sure. Isn't that a great word? You can be sure today. Listen, you can be sure today of where you're headed if you were to die. Do you have that surety? Do you have that assurance today? Hopefully every single one of us can say, Amen. Because God wants you to be sure. Listen, salvation based upon my own works is unsure. Because I have good days and I have 
bad days. Are you guys with me on that? It's like, oh yeah, I'm doing really awesome, and then it's nine o'clock, I get caught in traffic. Right? You get, and then you get cut off on the highway. What do you say to that person? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> Busted. Aren't you glad salvation doesn't depend upon us? His salvation is sure. We, we can be confident. We can be excited today about that. Thank you, Lord. And then Paul talks about the father of us all. And God told in verse 17, Abraham, that he noticed past tense, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. When he said that, Isaac wasn't even born yet. Isaac wasn't even born. And he said, notice it's past tense. I have made you. God already saw it as a done deal. It's done. I already made you a father of many nations. And that's when he, I think it's when he had his name changed too. Remember his name change? It went from Abram to Abraham. Abram, exalted father, glorious father. Abraham, father of many nations. Can you imagine, though, you get that name change and people are asking you, what's up with the name change, man? I'm father of many nations. How many kids you got? Zero. <laughs> I'm going ha- to have a whole bunch. I'm going to have many nations. How old are you? 99? Okay. <laughs> Dude, he's been out in the sun a little bit too long. Too many shawarma, you know. <laughs> But it's so beautiful because there's such a lesson on our faith, our trust in God here, you guys. When God makes a promise to you. I don't know about you guys, I love highlighting the Bible, the, in my Bible, my, the promises God gives us. And you hold on to those because that's a promise for us, his kids. God is faithful to his word. And so Isaac wasn't born yet. God told him this. God showed up. Awesome. And notice what it says. Who was he trusting in? God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. We learned something about God here this morning, don't we? Look what, it, look what it says in that verse. God who does what? God is in the business of raising the dead, you guys. Of giving life to the dead. Oh, he's done that spiritually, hasn't he, with us? Paul's, Paul's going to... Tell us later, we were dead in our what? Trespasses and sins. He's made us alive. We're born again. I'm alive spiritually. I get it. But you know what? Maybe this morning you've got a dead marriage. God wants to resurrect it. He's the one who can do it. He's the one who brings life. Start doing things his way and watch what he'll do. Maybe it's a dead ministry. Fruitless. You've been going for years. Man, I've been trying, mean, doing this, doing this, doing this. Maybe it's time to back off and say, Lord, I, I've been doing this apart from you. I need your help. God, I realize it. You need to bring some life. You need to breathe some life into this ministry, into this marriage, into this home, into this family. God will do it. You've got to look to him, though. He is able. He is the one who's able to do it. He's also the one who what? Who, who <laughs> look what it says. Who what? Who, who calls things which do not exist as though they did. He brings life and supernatural stuff to come to pass with just a word. I think that's amazing. God makes calls on stuff when we don't even see a way because he is the God of the impossible, you guys. You know, when David said that psalm after he got busted, remember what, remember, remember what he prayed? He prayed, create in me a clean heart. You guys remember that? That word create, it's the same word used in Genesis chapter 1 where it says God created. He created something out of nothing. You know what David was saying when he got busted? God, create in me a clean heart, Lord. I don't have one. Lord, you got to do it. You have to make it happen. And the Bible says when you place your trust in Jesus Christ, that's what he does. God puts a brand new heart in you. 
A new heart, a new start. What's our part? Simply to trust, to trust the Lord. I don't know about you, when I got saved, it was like the Lord took out my heart and put it in a new heart. I didn't care about anyone else. Before that, I didn't care about anyone else but me. And then it was weird because I cared about others. And I loved others. And it's not perfect because I... Lord showing me that. <laughs> I need some help. But I, when I gave my life to the Lord, it was like he took out my, this dark heart and put in a brand new heart of care and love for people, for others. And many of you guys can probably say amen to that. Me too. Thank you, Lord. Because he does it. Again, it's all about what he does. And so... Notice it's not some patch job, it's a new heart that he gives us. And notice what Abraham did. God gave him the promise, here's who God is. And then in verse 18, who, speaking of Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. So that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken so shall your descendants be, and not being weak in faith, don't miss this, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, don't miss this, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that he, that what he promised, he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is so beautiful. Guys, there's so many, that's such an important lesson this morning on faith. Look what it says. It says, contrary to hope, in hope he believed. Ever happened to you? It's like, there is no way this can happen, Lord. This is hopeless. There's no chance, not even remotely possible. It ain't going to happen. There's more month than money. Is that resonating with anybody here yet? Hopefully. There's no way you can fix this. There's no chance. Please notice, don't miss this, Abraham's faith was coupled with hope. He didn't give up. He didn't throw in the towel. What did he do? What did he do? He lived by faith. The just shall live, how? By faith, we're told. I keep trusting. I keep trusting you, Lord. And it says he kept trusting, kept obeying, and he became the father of many nations. God said, you're going to have many descendants. I trust you, Lord. I'll keep doing it. He believed God's promise. He believed God's word. And I think there's a lesson on faith here. You need a situation that's hopeless, but there's no solution. You come to a place where you have to choose to believe. It can't, you're thinking it can't get any better. There is no way it's going to work out. Things will not improve. Thing, there's no chance. But I trust you, Lord. And then what happens? We begin to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. That our hope would be in Him and not in ourselves in our own smarts, our own wisdom, our own strength, our own cleverness, our own ingenuity. But we're looking to the Lord. He brings us to that place where we have nowhere else to look, you guys. Anybody ever been there? I have. You've looked to the left. You've looked to the right. You've looked down until finally you look where? You look up. But what happens? We hit some rough patches some hopeless stuff, some hard times, and what happens? You know, you're just cruising, you, you and the Lord, right? He's in the driver's seat, though, not... You're and what happens? You hit some difficulty. And what typically happens? We begin to what? We magnify the issue, the circumstance, the impossibility, and it gets giant. And what happens to God? He gets minified. Rather than the other way around. Remember when the early church, the persecution started to heat up? They prayed. Remember how they, remember how they began that prayer? <laughs> Lord of heaven and earth, you've created everything. Oh, that brings everything right into perspective. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, you're looking down from heaven. You see everything. You know what's going on. You're able. 
I trust you. I don't see how this is going to work out, but I trust you. That's what Abraham said. You promised kids, I trust you, Lord. We'll keep trying. Because notice what it says in verse 19. Abraham was not weak in faith. He was around, how old was he? He was around what? What does it say in your Bible? A hundo. He's a hundred years old. He didn't look at the physical issues or the circumstances, his old inoperative body. Nor did he look at what? Sarah's expired reproductive system. And what do they experience? Resurrection in their bodies. Beautiful. I, important lesson. Abraham didn't elevate the physical circumstances, the impossibility over God's promise. Simple, simple lesson. Abraham ignored the impossibilities and trusted the Lord to keep his word. Can I encourage you this morning, precious brother and sister, to take God's promises and to trust him? You've got your, maybe, you, maybe this morning you've got your eyes off of the Lord. <coughs> on to your circumstances, on to someone else, on to this, on to that. And God has given you and me exceedingly great and precious promises. And it says in the book of Hebrews that it's by faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. We don't like the patience part, do we? But it's by faith and patience we inherit the promises. And we say that verse all the time too, don't we? We say, you know what? All God's promises are yea and amen. You ever thought about that? They're all yes. And how many are like, you know what? If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. There's more month than money. I don't know how this is going to work out financially. I'm strapped. I don't know. Man, Lord, you called me to this. You called me to do this. And how's this going to work out? And maybe I can finagle something over here or work, work a deal over here or do this rather than seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Do you trust him? Will you obey him? Yea and amen. It's not just the amen. Oh, I believe it. It's also, I'll walk in that, Lord. I'll seek first your kingdom. I'll trust you for that. And I'll watch you work in my life. I'll delight myself in you, Lord. It says, delight myself in you, and you will give me the desires of my heart. All right, I'll just start delighting. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what will he do? Direct your steps. Isn't that great? I need my steps directed, man. I'm like a sheep that gets tangled up in barbed wire and gets all jacked up. I need him to direct my steps. Such great. Take his promises. Hold on to them. Verse 20, Abraham was not wishy-washy, vacillating in unbelief concerning God's promise. In other words, here's a simple way to remember. He didn't get ripped off by the thief of unbelief. Abraham, what does it say? He was strengthened in faith. There's a, there's, a, there's a super thing in this verse. It's so key, you guys. How was he strengthened in faith? Look what it says. Verse 20. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. I think... For me, that is, that is a gem. Because we know later we're going to learn faith comes by hearing by the Word of God. I need to get strengthened in my faith. I need to get in the Word, spend time with the Lord. But there's something else here. How am I going to be strengthened in my faith? By giving glory to God. I don't know, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I trust you. I thank you for what you're going to do here in my life in my family, in my ministry, in whatever. I will praise you even though there's no evidence. <laughs> Is any of this resonating with you guys at all, hopefully? Do you guys remember when some of us, remember when we used to meet at Kids or Kids Daycare Center? Most, that's where we met for a long time, setting up chairs for like 10 years. Wednesdays, Saturdays, Sundays. And we had a little issue when we first signed our contract there for the rent. 
It actually got quadrupled. <laughs> we had zero fundage. We had zero money in our account to cover the quadruple upage. I don't know what the word is. Uh, addition. <laughs> Increase. Thank you. I, I, I had to sign the contract because I gave my verbal, I gave my word. I don't want to be, you know, dishonoring the name of the Lord, not honoring my word. So I, all right. We have to be standing out, out in front Sunday morning saying we don't have money for the rent. You know, let's go meet at the donut shop or whatever. But I, I was driving to a pastor's conference. The pastors, the Calvary Chapel pastors in town meet down at Calvary Houston regularly. And I'm cruising down the highway and I'm like, oh, I can't believe I signed this contract, Lord. We got no money, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm cruising and all, all of a sudden, bring, bring, Tanya calls. Hey, what's up, babe? I just jacked up the church. <laughs> we got, you never believe what happened. Well, she's like, don't, don't worry about it. Just listen to this. You can tell me later about how you jacked stuff up. You just got a, a letter from your ex-teammate you played with. Remember this guy, this pitcher? He just sent us a check for bada bing, bada bang, the four time increase on the, the exact amount for the rent. And I praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Right? You know, we're cruising. All right. We, we're dialed. We're going to take care of the rent. We're, we're, we're good. And then it was like, I got off the phone. Okay, babe. No, no problem. We're good now. See ya. Love ya. And I'm cruising. I felt like the Lord said to my heart, why weren't you praising me before the phone call? Giving thanks in everything for all things. God, forgive me. I'm learning, Lord. I'm growing. And, and I love it when precious brothers or sisters, they know you're going through a difficulty and, and they share with you, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. Let's just thank Him and praise Him. Because He's going to work all things together for good. He promises that to those that love Him. You can rest. Abraham gave glory to God. He ascribed worth, praise, honor to God. I don't see how this is going to work out, but I'll praise you anyway. And then look at verse 21. This is so important. Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what he said he would do. If God promised it, then he can do it. I trust him. I know you can do it, Lord. I know you can do it. I can't. You can. You can do it. And Abraham demonstrated that his faith was genuine. It was accounted to him for righteousness. And then as we finish, last three verses, because we got one minute left. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. That deal ain't just for Abraham. That's for you and me, gang. This righteousness imputed, put it on our account, given to us. Hey, it's different than my example earlier with Sloan. That, I know that account's going to keep running out. I'm going to have to keep throwing funds in there. Your account with God don't run out. You don't have to ma maintain righteousness. It's boom, given to you. It's a done deal. Thank you, Lord. Who's it imputed to? Look what it says. It shall be imputed to who? To us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Awesome. Who, speaking of Jesus, was delivered up. Why was he delivered up? Because of our offenses, our wrongdoing. And was raised because of our justification. Why was Jesus raised up? That we might have right standing before God, you guys. See, it's all about Him, what He's done. May we give Him thanks and praise, because He is worthy, amen? Amen. amen? amen, in Jesus' name. Lord, thank You so much this morning. What good news.
And so much bad news around us, Lord, we're reminded of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful, Lord, that we are partakers of this glorious program that you've imputed righteousness to our account, accredited to our account. You've removed our sin, our guilt, our shame, given us a new heart and a new start, and we just want to say thank you this morning. Thank you so much. And as we walk with you, thank you that you're working all things together for good. Guide our steps, Lord. Lead us in those paths of righteousness. For your name's sake. And as we finish our Bible study, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning, perhaps you've been listening and you've never come to that place of believing Jesus, trusting him. I don't think we need to labor it any longer. It's not an accident you're here or listening. Jesus loves you. He demonstrated his love by giving his life for you, dying on the cross for your sins and mine. He suffered, died, and was buried, and rose again on the third day. And he offers life to anyone that will come to him. He doesn't want anyone to die in their sins. And he's provided the way today for you to be forgiven to be declared not guilty to come into a right relationship with God maybe you're sitting here this morning saying yeah I've, I've never come to that place of a real genuine relationship I want to open my heart to Jesus right here right now would you raise up your hand can I pray with you right now it's the most important decision you'll ever make is concerning eternity if that's you I'm not asking you to join our church or sign a membership card or perform some ritual none of those things will save you only Jesus you need to respond to him. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not even promised your next breath. And the Lord's reaching out to you right now. Will you respond by raising up your hand and we're going to pray? Anyone at all this morning? Anyone at all? Father, thank you so much again. Sending Jesus. Thank you this morning, Lord Jesus. Thank you for lavishing upon us grace upon grace. For not giving up on us, for not firing us. For the work that you've begun that you're going to see through. As we look unto you, would you transform our lives? Cause us to grow in grace and the knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your precious and your holy name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 All right, so this morning, if you need prayer for anything, I know some of us are going through difficulties, tough season. We'll have some folks up front that would love to pray with you, to pray for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. As you continue to trust him, allow him to work in your life for his glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close out in worship today.
such an awesome and great God would care so, so deeply for us and allow us to be your children. God, we thank you for your word as it has gone forth today and for the things that you have spoken to us. Lord, may those things remain with us and may you continue to deal with us. And Lord, just to, to give us the strength to take these lessons that we learn, put them into practice, Lord, and to truly walk by faith, to trust you because you are faithful to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.